Well, good morning and welcome again to those that are here, and uh, good morning, at least from Australia, Eastern Australia, to those who will be watching this video a little later. So we're now back on, this is the Seven Trumpets Part 2. In Part 1 yesterday, as we were just speaking, we saw that the first four trumpets introduced scenes of strife and conflict, which led to the extinction of the Western Roman Empire centred around Rome. And the four main players in order were Alaric and the Goths, then came Genseric and the Vandals, then came Attila and the Huns, and the lastly was Adoasa, and a mix of barbarians including the Heruli, and he was of the Heruli as we understand it. And Adoasa is regarded as having ended the Western Empire, forcing the resignation of the last emperor, uh, Romulus Augustus. And we saw that the consulships and lastly the senate were abolished sometime later, being represented as darkening of the sun, the moon, and the stars in the fourth trumpet. We also saw the remaining three trumpets were announced to be woes. Now, unfortunately, Graham's not here. You might recall Graham mentioned that he's read, I think it was A.T. Jones had said, this angel is an eagle. Do you remember that? I looked into this because I've not seen it before. And I looked at it on Esau, and what I found was in Textus Receptus, the Greek Textus Receptus, for which we get the King James translation, it's very clear the word in there is the Greek word angel, messenger. Absolutely clear. When you go to the Apostolic Bible Polyglot, which is a Greek translation as well, it has the word for eagle, not the word for angel. Now it's interesting, the revised version has eagle in it. I think it's the Lexham English Bible has eagle as well. Which text again? The Which text were This is um, this one. Three words. This one. I heard an angel. So this word in some, and, and, and Graham's exactly right. The Apostolic Bible Colleague it says eagle. In the revised version, it says eagle. And I checked, I think it was the Lex Lexham English Bible. It also, there's just ones I have on Esau, it also says eagle. And some, if you have a modern translation, you may say eagle as well. But if we go to the Textus Receptus, now Textus Receptus is the manuscripts from which King James Version was derived and translated. It very clearly says angel. So all the texts that the Bible translations that come from Textus Receptus, they say an angel. It's these others coming from alternate um, Greek manuscripts are saying eagle. So what would it imply if there wasn't Well, I don't know. The eagle can't speak. Well, the eagle can't speak to start with. <laughs> However, one of the beasts that resembled an eagle, remember, it spoke. Uh, yeah, look, I don't know where that came from. All I know is we base our faith on the Textus Receptus, the received text, uh, which, from which the King James Version was translated. We know there are troubling um, ideas in some of these other translations. We do recall that the... No, we won't go there, so we'll distract ourselves. So we, we stand on Textus Receptus, the King James Version, for, for doctrine because it's proven over time to be the most reliable. Not perfect, but the most reliable. So that's a bit of background to that. So we saw the remaining three trumpets, five, six and seven, all announced to be woes. And we saw that the first four were fairly bad, but these are actually specifically called woes. So we would interpret that to mean they're worse. And so in Revelation 8.13, and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe. The inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And that brings us, now that was the end of chapter 8, as you recall. And that brings us now into chapter 9, which has in it the fifth and sixth woes. Uh, so fixed, yeah, fifth and sixth woes being the fifth and sixth trumpets. Now, 
Why are they called woes? Well, here's a very good explanation by Josiah Litch in Prophetic Expositions, Volume 2. And this was subsequently quoted by James White and Uriah Smith, so they both thought wholly of this explanation. The Roman Empire declined as it arose by conquest. But the Saracens and the Turks were the instruments by which a false religion became the scourge of an apostate church. So do we have sin, punishing sin? And hence, instead of the fifth and sixth trumpets like the former being marked by that name alone, they are called woes. It was because the laws were transgressed, the ordinances changed, and the everlasting covenant broken, that the curse came upon the earth or the land. Is that parallel with things we are discovering recently ourselves? Why would he use scribes and Pharisees? So are you saying because there's three things there, they're the three woes, or just as in No, no, it's just, I'm just highlighting the... Yeah, because the laws between verse and the ordinance has changed to everlasting covenant for it. Oh, there's three things there, good point, yeah. Yep. Not necessarily that they're each of those, but... There. Yeah. Well observed. Hmm. Hmm, well that's right. So I just thought you'd be encouraged by that quote. I certainly was. So Josiah Leach, absolutely, he's stating a principle that we know well from our studies. And God's commandments, statutes, judgments, feast days are disregarded or changed or abolished. Then the gift of the everlasting covenant is rejected. Then the way is open for sword and pestilence and famine to scourge the land for God's protection has been made of no effect. That's how we understand it, isn't it? And when you're not having God's protection over you, that is woe indeed, isn't it? All right, well, let's have a look. Revelation 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now we saw under the third trumpet, remember, a star fell, burned brightly, but it landed on water waves, remember? So the description is different in this verse. There's nothing remarkable about this star. It's not a great and burning star like the one in the third trumpet. And it fell on the earth, whereas one from the third trumpet fell on the fountains of waters and on the rivers. However, like the star of the third trumpet, this star also represents a leader. But which leader? Right, firstly, how do we know that a star represents a leader? I didn't explain this yesterday, so I'll bring it out now. But a star represents a messenger. Angel. Really? We'll see what the Bible says. This is Numbers 24:17. There's a parallelism, parallelism here. I shall, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. Who's this speaking of? Christ. But there's a principle here, an explanation. A star shall come out of David, and then it gets parallelism. So the next statement says the first statement, but a different way, scepter shall rise out of Israel. What does a scepter represent? Leadership. Leadership. So a star defined as a scepter or leader. Yeah, those ones were. Yeah, that's right. This is saying it's a leader. So yes, yeah, so a different application. You've got to take the context of it. So yes, there are other places where angels represent stars. This makes it really interesting when the, when the um, tail of the dragon took a third of the stars. Oh, a third of the angels. 
yes. But if you read very carefully in prophecy, it's also representing the, um, at the time of, um, of uh, Christ, there was, it's represented the three divisions of the uh, former kingdom of Israel and the leaders therein that were appointed by the Romans. It's very interesting. So context, <laughs> context is everything. Context is king, Debbie, thank you. Context is king. So in this particular one, we can be confident this is speaking about a leader. Now we've seen the first four trumpets brought us down to the fall of the Western Roman Empire and we see that they are sequential, one comes after the other. And it ended, the Western Roman Empire ended, I said, 476 AD. So we then expect the fifth trumpet announcement would describe events called a woe sometime subsequent to that date, wouldn't we? They're following sequentially, it's got to happen after that. Now, this is what Albert Barnes in his notes in the New Testament said when he's commenting on the fifth trumpet. He says, the whole scene is now, now has changed. Rome has fallen, it has passed into the hands of strangers. The power that had spread itself over the world has, in that form, come to an end. So he's talking about the pagan Roman Empire, and it's to exist no more. Though, as we shall see, he's talking about Revelation 11, another power, quite as formidable, existing there, is to be described by a new set of symbols. What's he talking about now? He's talking about the rise of the papacy, because he's still speaking of Rome. But here, Revelation 9, a new power appears. The scenery is all oriental, and clearly has reference to events that would spring up in the East. With surprising unanimity, commentators have agreed in regarding this as referring to the Empire of the Saracens or to the rise and progress of the religion and empire set up by Muhammad. Surprising unanimity. It is surprising that so many commentators agreeing on one point, isn't it? You ever seen this before? Yeah. What is it? It's the 1843 Millerite chart. It's got all the prophetic symbols and the years. Now we're going to be interested in those years up there. Now I took the opportunity to blow it up a bit. The printing's blurred, but this is what we're talking about. 606, 1299, 1499. Why are there three dates? Well, we'll see that as we go through this. So this chart shows the um, fifth trumpet commenced in 606 AD and ran through to 1449. Now, this date, if you read a bit about the life of Muhammad, it's, the date is chosen because that was, it's taken to be the year in which Muhammad, he, um, he would, every year go and seclude himself away somewhere to, to um, meditate and fast and, and be close to God. 606 is taken as the year when Muhammad claimed Gabriel appeared to him in a cave where he was um, in respite and gave him his first revelation from God. Now I haven't been able to verify, I don't know where they got, oh, go back. I don't know where they got that date from. Um, some say 610, but the point is that's not critical. To the prophecy whether it's 606 or the 6010, that's not the critical date. That is a very, very, very critical date. And we'll see that when we get there soon. Alright, so Muhammad. Do we read it? No, going back a bit. So we read that Muhammad was given the key for the bottomless pit. Do you remember that? Let's go back. He was given the key of the bottomless pit. Should have brought that one forward again, shouldn't I? All right. Bottomless pit. The Greek word is abusos, meaning without depth or abyss. Now in the Greek Old Testament, the same word, same Greek word, does anyone know where it's first used? 
Genesis 1 verse 2, the world was out form and void. Desolate. Desolate. Yes. The word, um, it's translated face of the deep. In, um, it translates the face of the deep in the, in the um, Greek Old Testament. The word may refer to any waste or desolate and uncivilised place. Now in the case of Revelation 9 verse 1, its use may be a very good description of the unknown wastes of the Arabian desert from which the Saracens swarmed like locusts. So what opened the way for them? What was this key? The Kingdom of Persia has stood at, had stood as a barrier keeping in check the growing power of Muhammad. However, trouble came upon the Kingdom of Persia and after a period of wars and internal strife, the Persian Kingdom fell to the Arabs in 651. This was the key that opened the bottomless pit because there was no longer anything to prevent them coming from Arabia and through. Verse 2, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The beginning of this verse actually proves that Persia was the wall that prevented the Saracens from overflowing towards Constantinople and towards Europe. And it proves it because there was no smoke coming out of the pit before it was opened. You notice, that's what it says. So it means no Muslim influence entered Eastern Europe before the fall of Persia. If you check your history, that's true. See how accurate these prophecies are. See how Stephen Haskell described us speaking of this. Welcome, Craig. Yay. Glad to see you here safely. Particularly glad as you're speaking next. <laughs> Welcome. So this is what Stephen Haskell said. Modern Persia has stood as a barrier keeping in check the power of Muhammad. But when that power fell, the barrier was gone, the bottomless pit opened and the Saracens deluged the world. When the bottomless pit was opened, there arose a smoke which hid the face of the sun. The figure is a strong one, representing the darkening effect of Mohammedanism as it spread over the face of the earth. Verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Note, how do you understand this? So John describes these Saracens as locusts and the doctrine that impelled them was as a dense smoke pouring out of a furnace. Why liken, why liken them to locusts? Swarming? What else do we know about locusts? What happened in Egypt? What did the locusts do? Yeah. <laughs> they took the lot. They did. They ate everything. They consumed everything. And they had a lot of children. Yeah, and they have lots of children. That's right, <laughs> that as well. <laughs> and they're, they're used as symbols of uh, destruction and desolation, aren't they, in the Bible? It's interesting, locusts don't seem to have a king. We'll get there. In fact, you must be reading my notes, that's exactly where we're going yeah. next. So, yes, yeah, so the first uh, example of locusts was the eighth plague, where they're in Egypt, where locusts came in vast numbers and then consumed everything that hadn't already been destroyed by the fire and, and the hail and everything else. And yes, Tony, Proverbs 30, 27, exactly what you were saying. Locusts have no king, yet go they forth, all of them, by bands. This is what Albert Barnes said about this. The natural application of this symbol then is to a numerous and destructive army or to a great multitude of people committing ravages and sweeping off everything in their march. For those of you that know the history, is that a reasonable representation of what happened with Saracen invasions? Every man shall be against him and him against every man. So there's that nature. Yes, there. And they have a king, that nature is destructive as well. Yes. Descendants of Ishmael. Can I also mention something a bit older? 
Yep. That, that's how I, I, I <laughs> you have to be starving. <laughs> it, it gives the idea that, that they're, they're edible. I agree. That, that's how I would read it. They're, um, locust is also uh, some kind of plant. I mean, John the Baptist ate locusts. The, the understanding is it's not the animal, it's the insects he was eating. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. As I read Leviticus, it does say the locust. Yeah. After its, no, it's kind, that's right. That's right. That's right. I know. He gave them judgments and and uh, that were not good for them. <laughs> Maybe that's one of them. <laughs> I don't fancy a plate of roasted locusts, quite frankly. True, Tony, that's true. That's true. So the prophecy says that under them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. What is the power of a scorpion? He has a dreadful sting in his tail. Is that right? A nasty, nasty sting. Have you ever been stung by a scorpion? No. No. <laughs> I never do. Sting's not always fatal but it does cause acute and dangerous suffering. And this way, John describes the pain and the suffering inflicted by the Saracens. Now, oh, back one. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So how do you command a locust not to eat grass? That shows an attribute of the mercy of God that even though it's massive destruction, there's some restraint there still by God. Yeah. That's right, Tony. That's exactly right. And we see that right through, the, and particularly this trumpet, because there was limitation on the power of this, of this trumpet. And does that mean literal grass, the earth? Does that mean no, it's, it's, it's symbolic. It's symbolic. The same as the grass was, was um, burnt before the, the Goths. They just, when they left, there was just devastation behind them. Well, it says men's like a grass, and the flower of the grass is mm. like the glory of men. So when Muhammad died, he was succeeded by, anyone know? Abu Bakr. In 632 AD, uh, he uh, reigned only for two years. But it was he who mobilised the Saracens for conquest. The conquest of Persia began in 632. As the Saracens advanced through Persia, every man, every Persian was given the choice of death or accepting the doctrine of Muhammad. And multitudes of Persians accepted the doctrines of Muhammad. Now this had already happened in Arabia under Muhammad. He couldn't. The process of conversion was too slow. And so they used the sword and gave people the choice. Paper Rome just killed you if they didn't like it. It's interesting that it's the same method that they used. Yeah. But, yeah. But, um, yeah, to a degree, some of the Christians were told to recant their Christian views or, or, or die. That's right. So you're correct there. But this is, yes, adopting this. All they asked the Christian Jews to renounce Christ. They weren't forcing them to become pagan, just renounce Christ or die. Whereas these guys are saying, adopt this religion or die. How do you enter wholesomely into a religion when you're forced to do so? It's got problems all over it. Now, uh, Abu Bakr also sent an invading force into Syria. And before this expedition started, he sent a letter to the Saracen tribes with these instructions. Now, notice carefully what it says. 
When you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs. But let not your victory be stained by the blood of women and children. So there's restraint, as you're saying, Tony. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. When you make any covenant or article, stand to it, and be as good as your word. And as you go, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries, and propose to themselves to serve God that way. Let them alone, and neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. And you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns. Oh, yes. Be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter to they either turn Mohammedans or pay tribute. How do you cleave their head and then get money from them? No, either. Either. Now notice the fulfilment of the prophecy here. It was commanded them, prophecy says, it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. The command, as we see here from Abu Bakr, was to spare trees and crops as well as women, children and animals. The Christians who lived in monasteries and did no harm were to be spared, but the prophecy said that they would hurt only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So who did Abu Bakr identify as those that did not have the seal of God in their foreheads? He didn't know he was doing that, but how did he identify them? You'll find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns. Of whom is he speaking? These are priests, friars. So these are the clergy of the, of the Roman Catholic Church at that time. He's speaking of... Yeah, that's right. It was a, it was a representation of, of paganism. Huh? <laughs> Worship the sun or right this time if you had it. <laughs> no, shaven gap, shaven, it's okay. Alright, verse 5. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes the man. And we said the scorpion strikes you, you probably won't die, but you're going to be in so much pain you wish you were dead. And in those days shall men seek death, and they'll want to be dead, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Does this sound like woe? Where are we up to? All right, so here we have a prophetic period of five months. Tormented five months. Now, how long a period is this? How many biblical days are there in a month? 30. 30. How do you know? All right, let me show you how we know. This is how we know this series of texts here. In the 600th year of Genesis 7 11, the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Verse 24. And the waters prevailed upon the earth, how long? 150 days. And the waters returned off the earth continually, and after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated, and the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month. 17th day of the month. How many months later? Five months later. Covering 150 days. How many days to a month? 30. 30. Okay, that's how we get there. You got that? If you didn't know it before, you yeah, take a note of it. Because that's how we prove it. And then 12 times 30 is how we get 360 days in a, in a biblical year. And then applying the uh, year day principle, Numbers 1434, Ezekiel 4 6. We say five months, 150 days, 150 years. So that's where we get 150 years. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, right? And their 
tormentless as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. So these verses these are referring to the uh, Saracen's torment of the Eastern Roman Empire. In the same way that a scorpion is said, the same way a scorpion sting doesn't usually kill but causes immense pain, dangerous pain even, but not necessarily fatal, but dreadful, dreadful suffering. So the question is, was the Eastern Roman Empire sorely tormented but not destroyed by the Saracens for 150 years? Well, let's have a look at the rest of the prophecy. It tells us some more information here. Verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. As we just saw. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, as many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue was Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So they have a king over them. Eventually. So we need to look at that. Interesting, there's a specific application, there's a generic application that refers to the mon uh, Satan, the destroyer. Yeah, well, yeah, well, it's a bit tighter than that, but yes, you're right. Ultimately, that's where it comes from. So, so, so what was the name of um, Muhammad's successor? Is it something like Abu Bakr. So in verses 7 to 10 here, John's trying to describe the Saracens. They used horses extensively. We know about the Arabian horses. Great horses. They were such good horsemen, they almost appeared to be part of the horse. The horse and bride appeared to be like a single unit. They were so good. They wore turbans as their national headdress. And they had long hair. But they were as ferocious as lions, which is likely the reference to their teeth. Now, just as locusts had to have a hard cuticle protecting them, so the Saracens had breastplates. In his 1833 books, The Signs of the Times, now this is what we saw Uriah Smith quoted from just recently, uh, a man by the name of Alexander Keith, Mr. Um, Uriah Smith referred to him as Mr. Keith, wrote a book, The Signs of the Times, as denoted by the fulfilment of historical predictions traced down from the Babylonish captivity to the present time. They love short titles in those days. Uh, so in that book, Alexander Keith stated that the breastplate, breastplate or curious was in use by the Saracens during the time of Muhammad. The Saracen army, so this is what John was saying about the iron, the breastplates. The Saracen army was mostly cavalry and archers. And typically where the archers come behind the cavalry, firing over the top of them, stings in the tail. And because they're all mounted on horses, the sound of their wings, as it was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, is how John described it. Because in John's day, infantry marched. So it's a very different sound of infantry marching to battle, as opposed to cavalry riding their horses into battle. Now as we already saw in verse 5, the Saracens caused suffering and pain that John likened to the sting of a scorpion and it would last for 150 years. And verse 11 says they had a king over them. And we just saw earlier Solomon said, locusts, what? They don't have a king. They have locusts like have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. <coughs> now it's true that the Saracens had no form of central government. 
as signified by the word king. They had caliphs. Caliphs. Yeah. Each one was a caliphate. You heard of that language? They were like a head religious person, that's I think as I understand, it, yes, over a group. I, I think President Erdogan sees himself in that role, yeah. That's my understanding. But things changed. In Daniel and Revelation we read this. From the death of Muhammad until near the close of the 13th century, the Mohammedans were divided into various factions under several leaders, with no general civil government extending over them all. Right? The locusts had no leader, had no king. Near the close of the 13th century, Othman, you heard of this man? Othman founded a government which has since been known as the Ottoman government or empire, which grew until it extended over all the principal Mohammedan tribes, consolidating them into one grand monarchy. And so the locusts had a king. Yes, do you notice the year? <laughs> Near the end of the 13th century? We're about to step into hot water, brethren. First of all, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit was the wastes of Arabia. It's a description of the wastes of Arabia. So we know where these people are coming from. Whose name in the Hebrew tongue, who, so I should have highlighted this. What do we understand by that in the Greek? Whose name in the Hebrew tongue, whose character in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So, what was the character of this king described as the angel of the bottomless pit, whose names are Abaddon and Apollyon? His name is character. Now, as we've already seen in verses 1 and 2, Muhammad was represented as a star that fell from heaven and was given the key to the bottomless pit, which was the ultimately the destruction of the, per the fall of the Persian Empire. The opening of the bottomless pit released smoke, the Muhammad re M M Muslim religion, that darkened the sun and the air, which represented the release of the Mohammedanism from the wastelands of Arabia upon the fall of the Persian Empire. But this is a very accurate prophecy when understood correctly. However, a king arose to bring all the Muslim tribes together under one government. This king, Othman, in fact, there he is there, uh, or Osman, Osman I, you might see him written as if you're re researching some of this, is the angel of the bottomless spit. Uriah Smith described it this way. The character of the king, he says, this is in Daniel Revelation 5.06, which is the angel in the bottomless pit. An angel signifies a messenger, a minister, either good or bad, and not always a spiritual being. The angel in the bottomless pit, or chief minister of the religion which came from thence when it was opened. That religion is Mohammedanism, and the Sultan is its chief minister. The Sultan, or Grand Signor, how do you say that? Signor? Signor? I think it's G. Sultan, isn't it? Signor? as he is indifferently called, is also supreme caliph or high priest. So all the caliphates became under one caliph. Uniting in his person the highest spiritual dignity with the supreme secular authority. Now I don't believe it's any coincidence. We're seeing now in the Eastern Roman Empire, around the year heading up towards 1300, a person emerges in whom is centralised civic power and religious power. Running in parallel with this, beginning in 538 in the Western Roman Empire, the former Western Roman Empire, we have a person there given supreme civil power and ecclesiastical power. So we have these two forces in the East and the West, all operating against the Word of God. No good comes when ecclesiastical power and civil power are united in the same entity.
way down through time protected the Christians from the other powers. How do you Oh, true. That's right. That's right. They were each doing their work. But I'm saying that we've got these two things running in parallel. They did, to a point, protect the Christians from the from the um, papacy. That's true. That's true. What they thought were true Christians. But, yes, it's certainly what they thought were true Christians. Uh, they have this mindset that they, you seem to connect with them if they see a fundamental belief. So the moment they know you don't eat pork and you believe in one God, mm. it's like their guard drops. Mm. True, they, true. They welcome you in. It's yeah. interesting. But remember, the smoke darkened the sun. What's that telling us? Oh, it's it, the, the yeah. It's not pure religion from in, from, from God's point of view. Yeah. It's almost like a checks and balances between the two uh, dialectics for us to have some refuse. Keeps, keeps, mm. You know, while they're busy fighting each other or whatever, the, the Christians mm. can get on and do that. Uh, and and God has His true children, even even in the, in those groups. You remember that. Right, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. As we've seen before, as we talk, the Greek word translated name also carries the meaning of authority and character. According to Strong's, Abaddon means a destroying angel, coming from the Hebrew word meaning perishing uh, and destruction. An example of its use in the old, in the, is in Job 31.12. For it is a fire that consumeth to destruction to Abaddon, and would root out all mine increase. So that's the use of the Hebrew word, destroyer. Now, Apollyon means one who destroys or destroyer. So the locusts now had a king, and the name or character of that king was destroyer, both in Hebrew and in Greek. Stephen Haskell said, This character might in truth be imputed to the Arab caliphs who directed the armies for so many years after the death of Muhammad, but is especially applicable to Othman, the founder of the Ottoman Empire. This, the first attempt at centralisation of government, was the outgrowth of the doctrines of Muhammad. Othman, says historian, possessed and perhaps surpassed the ordinary virtues of a soldier, and the circumstances of time and place were propitious to his independence and success. So he just... Everything was right for Othman to be able to do what he did and bring together the caliphs into, into a single unit. Now that brings us back to the question we put on hold earlier. Was the Eastern Empire sorely tormented but not destroyed by the Saracens for 150 years? Well, we'll continue to read from Stephen Haskell. The close of the 13th century was near. The Crusades had thrust Europe against the Turks in a most reckless manner. Constantinople had numerous emperors, but the Greek government grew weaker and the time of this destruction was stealthily approaching. It was on July 27, AD 1299, says Gibbon, that Othman first invaded the territory of Nicomedia. And the singular accuracy of the date seems to disclose some foresight of the rapid and destructive growth of the monster. More than human foresight could have recorded this date with such definiteness. To the prophet on Patmos it had been revealed that their power was to hurt men five months. So, this date, 27th July 1299, what does Stephen Haskell say about it? More than human foresight recorded this date with such definiteness. So if a date's put forward with such definiteness, what's going to happen to that date? It will be attacked. And so we step into hot water. Now it's claimed that Edward Gibbon, I'll explain this to you, and I'll bring this board over that the camera may see it. And bounce, bounce, bounce. Okay, is that in view? Good, okay. The claim is that Edward Gibbon, and there was a historian, a historian that these, uh, particularly Uriah Smith um, and Stephen Haskell and others relied on, 
has claimed Edward Gibbon read the date incorrectly from his source material. Now this, yes. Now interesting, and this is what caused me a bit of distress when I was starting reading this, because the answer to this wasn't apparent. Uh, both W.W. W. Prescott and W.A. Spicer. Now Spicer was, I believe, our third GC president following Daniels. Is that correct, that your recollection, Craig? It's very early on anyway. I think it was, I think he might have been third. So he was, he was general conference president. Both he and Prescott believed the date should have been the 27th of July, 1301, two years later. And this is incredibly significant when we get to the end of the sixth trumpet. Incredibly significant. Because if your starting point is right, your ending point is right. If your starting point is wrong, your ending point will be wrong. Okay. And this has undermined the faith of so many people in our denomination. Right, so why did they think that? So this is an extract. The great controversy was being reviewed. And these men believed they were protecting Ellen White because she had gone at 12 July, um, it was the 27th of July, 1299. And they wanted to change because they believed Gibbon had got it wrong. And so their motives were to protect the writings of, Miss, of Mrs. White, as I understand it. So this is a letter Spicer wrote to the review committee, I'm thinking if I remember this correctly. So he says, I'll also close, enclose some material on the dates, the prophetic periods of Revelation 9. Some time ago, Professor Prescott and I went to the Library of Congress. He looked up the history of, okay, let's go to here first of all, to our board. But this gentleman, Patchy Maris, I believe his name is, he lived uh, from 1200, and he lived about the time of this happening anyway, from mid, <coughs> mid to late 1200s to early 1300s, I think it was. I've got that somewhere, I'm going to just check that to my notes. Actually, it might be in a slide in a moment, let's see. 1242 to about 1310. So he wrote, he was a Byzantine historian. Georgius Pachymeris. So he wrote the account of what happened. Right. So this is the uh, so this is the original source. The other source. Source. Thank you. So this is the source. Original source. Pachymeris. This man. Piscinus, um, a French Jesuit scholar, Pierre Piscinis, so perhaps he lived 1609 to 1686. He translated this work into Latin. So this is number two. So he's translated that into Latin. Gibbon relied on his work. Right, so uh, Uriah Smith and Haskell and others have relied on Gibbon, Edward Gibbon. He got his information from Pacinus, who translated from Pachymeris. Okay, we've got this. Now, let's read on a little bit. So he, that is Prescott, looked up the history of Pachymeris, translated into Latin with Pacinus. Okay, that's this and this. Give that camera a moment, come back and back on. Yeah. And one of them was a Yeah, just hang on. That, that, that's, yeah, he was a scholar, wherever that came from, yes. I wouldn't go reading anything into that fact. It is from this book that Gibbon got his date, from the book, book written by Pacinus. That Gibbon got his date, July 27, 1299. He says, I looked up on Hammer. Okay, another name down here. Who is the heaviest German author on Ottoman history. So this guy's expert on Ottoman history. So, Spicer believed. It is clear that Gibbon made an error which von Hammer and others have corrected. 
The way Gibbon arrived at his mistake is easily seen by looking at the Pacinus translation of the Pachymera. So he's gone to here to look at this. So his translation, Gibbon's gone to this, they are now looking at this based on what von Hammer has said. Gibbon saw July 27 at the opening of chapter 25. So he's gone through this, chapter 25, and he's found July 27. No year. And then over in the chronological table, so Pacinus has done an analysis and he's put some chronological tables at the back of his book. And what they're saying is, I'll read it on, he saw the date 1299. Combining these, so he's got this uh, July 27 from chapter 25 and 1299 from the chronological tables at the back of the book. But he failed to note that the chapter began with July 27, but then went back and dealt with earlier events. These earlier events were the events of 1299. Thus, the 1299 date in the table given by Pacinus. It was not until 1301 that the Battle of July 27 took place. What do we do with that? <laughs> I prayed very hard about it, that's what I did. All right, and so I then started searching. And I found this. Now, it's a, this is an extract from a thesis paper from, I think a student at Andrews. Uh, the paper's titled From Clear Fulfillment to Complex History, The History of the Adventist Interpretation, Revelation 9 from 1833 to 1957, um, by a young man by the name of John, <coughs> Stefan Stefanson. So here's some information from his paper. Grace Amadon, you heard of her before? Yeah, you know, she was the one who did some work on the crucifixion week in terms of the moon phases. Grace Amadon argued against Von Hammer. So Grace Amadon's done some research. She's arguing against this guy. She's saying, no, no, he's got a problem. So if he's got it wrong, what's that mean? Prescott and Spicer have got it wrong. wrong, if Grace is right. She says, he transferred his date from the Islamic calendar incorrectly by Hammer. Following the chronology of the Hadshi Chalfa, this is some kind of a calendar I think, he placed the battle in the year AH, this is a Turkish calendar, 701, so it translate he translated it 1301, right? So you've got his Turkish calendar saying it happened in 701 their time. What's that mean in our time? He's translated it 1301. She says, however, the July 27 battle could not have been fought in the year AH701, for that year lasted a different year to us, September 1301 to August 1302. So it can't be. Then she says, when the battle was fought, the river surrounding the Byzantine castle changed its bed three times. And we'll talk about this Byzantine castle <coughs> one. But finally, so the river running past the castle changed its bed three times, but finally returned to its original bed. But because of this, the castle moat became so filled with silt and sand that the enemy could cross on foot. So this, the moat was useless. These conditions fit with the summer of 1299, and the winter before it had been very harsh, so there was much snow, water, and spring, but not with the summer of 1301, which Pachymene has described as very dry. So the, the climate is telling Grace Allen with her, with her um, research that the timing doesn't fit. Von Hammer's timing doesn't fit. This fellow's timing does fit and what Gibbon got from it. And the other thing is, in his history, Pachymere's forced, uh, traced the period 1299 to 1302, but then backed up the battle of 1299. Due to Pachymere's many synchronisms, and this Pachymereism he wrote, he went back and forth and back and forth a bit. But this scholar, Pacinus, was aware of this backing up. But this backtracking, along with the fact that Pachymere has described two major battles with the Byzantines, not one but two, 
the first time Ottoman, Ottoman attacked Nicomedia in 1299, and then the Battle of 1302 when they finally beat the Byzantine general who had escaped them three years earlier, caused later historians to confuse the two battles into one and to date it from the time of the later battle, thus placing the date of the real first battle too late. So, and this article by Grace Amador, the article was, um, she did this research in 1944, and I found the articles in the Ministry magazine, June 1944 and July 1944. And I have copies of those articles if anyone um, must have been sent them to them at some time. So, just move this thing back again. All right, so look, I debated whether I'd go through the detail of this and just sort of gloss over the top. I think it's important to understand that we have very, very good reason to stand with our pioneers on the date of 27 July, 1299. And we'll see the absolute critical need for this when we get to the, the, uh, to the sixth uh, trumpet. All right, so can you sort of grasp what I'm saying? You see that there's confusions in the camp. So some people haven't done their homework correctly. Uh, Prescott, surprising, Prescott and, and, um, and uh, Spicer did not do their homework correctly. We'll describe Prescott as being very excitable with new messages. So that probably expands, expands the fact that he was probably not thorough in the way he did his research. That's possible too, Tony. Yes, I, I, don't, I don't know. I know Prescott was an absolute blessing with his um, preaching of the third angel's message, Rushes by Faith, out here in Australia when he was out here. Yes, it's sad that he developed other ideas a little later, particularly 1919, the Bible conference. All right, so have I got any more here? No, I have not. Okay. So, as a, as a result of all this, I stand more confidently than ever on the prophetic, prophetic platform laid down by our pioneers. Now, we'll just digress just a moment. From the time of Muhammad to the time of Othman, the Saracens had spread south and west. And here's a short history of their conquests from Stephen Haskell. This is worth a read because this had happened, a lot of things had happened before Othman established a central government. By 638, the conquest of Egypt had, was begun. The conquest of Africa from the Nile to the Atlantic was attempted by the Caliph of Othman in 647, but the Moors were not conquered until the beginning of the next century. And then the Muslim faith was accepted from Syria to the Straits of Gibraltar. In 711, the, Arab crossed, the, the Arabs crossed these straits into Spain, and the horn of the crescent, the Muslim standard, reached the Pyrenees. So where's that? The top of? Italy, isn't it? Yes. Thus the power of their arms was extended. They had hoped to encircle the Mediterranean and having driven out the papacy to seek Mohammedanism in the place of Christianity in the city of the Seven Hills. But in 732 AD, the onward progress of the Saracens was checked by Charles Martel in the Battle of Tours in France. And relinquishing the hope of gaining Europe from the west, the Mohammedans retreated into Spain. Here, this is interesting, here they established schools and by the cultivation of arts and sciences won by the intellect what they had failed to gain by the sword. It was from Toledo, Salerno and other Spanish centres of learning that the light of scientific knowledge shone into the darkness of Europe during the Middle Ages and acted its part in breaking the strength of the papacy at the dawn of the Reformation. Isn't that interesting? This is the history of the Saracens as they marched south and west. They gradually lost their warlike characteristics and conquered by the power of intellect. The experience of the Western Empire was different to that of the Eastern Empire. The fall of the Western Empire was not due to the Muslims, as we've already seen. The prophecy of torment of five months was a prophecy of the Eastern Empire. 
until the rise of Othman, the Saracens had been very troublesome for the Eastern Empire. But it had, and it had lost territory to the Saracens. However, the rise of Othman brought trouble at a new level. So, this is a map of that particular area. As we saw, July 27, 1299, Othman invaded the territory of Nicomedia. That's that part there. So we've got Constantinople, there's Istanbul, modern Istanbul, former Constantinople, just there. And so, 27th of July, 1299, came the battle there. The first of two. And so, July 27, 1299 is a strong date and we can rely on it. Uriah Smith said, commencing July 20, 27, 1299, the 150 years reached to 1449. During that whole period, the Turks were engaged in an almost perpetual warfare with the Greek Empire, yet without conquering it. They seized upon and held several of the Greek provinces, but still Greek independence was maintained in Constantinople. But in 1449, the termination of the 150 years, a change came. The history of which will be found under the succeeding trumpet, trumpet six, and that's quite correct. So what happened in 1449? This is what Robert Whelan said. The Eastern Roman emperors had become gradually weaker and more corrupt until it became clear to everyone that they would soon lose their independence. When the Emperor John died in October 13, 31, 1448, his brothers humbly sought the consent of the Turkish Sultan, Murad II, this is the son of, oh, I'll get to this, Mahomet. we'll see this in a moment, to choose their elder brother to be crowned as the new Emperor in January of 1449. Thus, in bowing to the Sultan of Turkey, they acknowledged that their independence was at an end. And Robert Whelan says, remember this, it's an important point. In bowing to the Sultan of Turkey, they acknowledged that their independence was at an end. History repeats. Remember this. We'll see this tomorrow. So what Pastor Whelan is talking about here is he's speaking about Constantine uh, Paleologos. John is John Paleologos. It was the last dynasty of emperors in, in, uh, in, the, West, in the Eastern Empire. So John Paleologos died without children. He had three younger brothers. Next youngest was Constantine. So it was Constantine that they asked the Sultan uh, Murad to give his approval that he could be recognised as emperor. And so Constantine Paleologos became Constantine XI, was crowned emperor on the 6th of January 1449. Now, go to Wikipedia. One of Constantine's, this is Constantine XI, Constantine Paleologos, one of Constantine's most pressing concerns was the Ottomans. One of his first acts as emperor, just two weeks after arriving in the capital, was to attempt to secure the empire by arranging a truce with Murad II. He sent an ambassador, Andronicus Iogaris, to the Sultan. Iogaris was successful and the agreed upon truce also included Constantine's brothers in the Moraya, that's down the southern part of uh, Greece, uh, to secure the province from further Ottoman attacks. All right, so, Constantine XI has managed to create a truce with Murad II, who is the Supreme Caliph of the Ottomans. So this brought a little bit of breathing space to the beleaguered Eastern Empire. For Sultan Murad II did in fact turn his attention away from Constantinople, but he met his death on the 3rd of February 1451. Uh, he was succeeded by his son Mohammed Mehmed, is it the second? He had no interest in the truce, but the truce between Constantine XI and Murad II held, and the physical torment of the Ottomans towards the Eastern Empire eased 
But the mental torment continued and the threat continued because the Ottomans still surrounded Constantinople. It was Ottoman held country, countryside all the way around Constantinople. And so the threat was there just like an Ottoman scimitar held above their heads. However, things were about to change for the worse. For the imposed limitation of torment, remember the fifth seal, all right, hurt only. But that was only under the fifth, oh, sorry, under the fifth trumpet. So but this restriction was about to be lifted. And the Ottomans bird to be released unfettered under the sixth trumpet. And so Revelation 9.12 says, One woe is past, behold, there come two more woes hereafter. So there we have the history of the fifth trumpet. As I said, hot water in there because this date, 27 July 1299, is so hotly contested. But we'll be in boiling water tomorrow. We have a more sure word of prophecy. If we understand this correctly, the record under the fifth trumpet is very, very accurate. We have a more sure word of prophecy. And we have to cling to the prophetic understandings of our pioneers. They laid down a firm foundation and we can stand in confidence on it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the more sure word of prophecy. We thank you, Father, as we understand and delve into these things, we can see that you gave a correct view to our pioneers. And Father, we thank you for the work of people like Grace Amadon, who got in and studied these things and presented evidence that gives us assurance that these things are true in the face of so many doubts. And Father, we just pray for those who have lost their way because of doubting you at this prophetic interpretation. And Father, just pray that through the influence of your spirit, we, our faith will be maintained in the prophetic understandings of our pioneers. And that we can be certain we have a more sure word of prophecy. Your word is reliable. We can rely on it. And Father, I just thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you.